please join me in welcoming Bill Lind. Where does all this stuff we've heard about this morning, <clears throat> the victim feminism, the gay rights movement, the invented statistics, the rewritten history, the lies, the demands, all of the rest of it, where does it come from? I would hope that that would be a question that would be at the forefront of the mind of anyone who is caught up in this. When I was listening to our first panelists talk about the discovery that men and women's brains differ as regard to their ability with spatial relationships, I immediately <coughs> thought of the fact that anyone who's ever gone grocery shopping knows that. Because nine out of ten shopping carts left in the middle of the aisle are left there by women. If I said that today on many American campuses, I would be hauled up on trial, literally on trial, in a kangaroo court and face some kind of punishment. For the first time in our history, Americans have to be fearful of what they say, of what they write, and of what they think. They have to be afraid of using the wrong word, a word that is denounced as offensive or insensitive, as racist, sexist, or homophobic. We have seen other countries, particularly in this century, <clears throat> where this has been the case, and we have always regarded them with a mixture of pity and, to be truthful, some amusement, because it has struck us as so strange that people would allow a situation to develop where they had to be afraid of what words they used. But we now have that situation in this country. We have it primarily on college campuses, but we have it spreading throughout the whole society. Where does it come from? What is it? We call it political correctness. The name originated as something of a joke, literally in a comic strip. And we tend to still think of it somehow as only half serious. In fact, it's deadly serious. It is the great disease of our century, the disease that has left tens of millions of people dead in Europe, in Russia, in China, indeed around the world. It is the disease of ideology. PC is not funny. PC is deadly serious. And if we look at it analytically, and if we look at it historically, we quickly find out exactly what it is. Political correctness is cultural Marxism. It is Marxism translated from economic into cultural terms in an effort that goes back not to the 1960s and the hippies and the peace movement, but back to World War I. If we compare the basic tenets of political correctness with classical Marxism, the parallels are very obvious. First of all, both are totalitarian ideologies. The totalitarian nature of political correctness is revealed nowhere more clearly than on college campuses, many of which have at this point become small, ivy-covered North Koreas, where the student or faculty member who dares to cross any of the lines set up by the gender feminists and the homosexual rights activists or the local black group or Hispanic group or any of the other sainted victims groups that PC revolves around quickly finds themselves in judicial trouble. They face within the small legal system of the college, they face formal charges, they face some kind of star chamber proceeding, and they face punishment. That is a predecessor that is a little look into the future that political correctness intends for the nation as a whole. Indeed, all ideologies are totalitarian because the essence of an ideology, and I would note that conservatism correctly understood is not an ideology, but the essence of an ideology is it takes some philosophy, 
And it says, on the basis of this philosophy, certain things must be true, such as women are oppressed, and that the whole of the history of our culture is the history of the oppression of women. Since reality contradicts that, reality must be forbidden. It must become forbidden to acknowledge the reality of either our history or our current circumstances. People must be forced to live a lie. And since people are naturally reluctant to live a lie, they naturally use their eyes and ears to look out there and say, well, wait a minute, this just isn't true. I can see it isn't true. The power of the state must be put behind the demand to live a lie. And that is why an ideology invariably creates a totalitarian state. Second, the cultural Marxism of political correctness, like economic Marxism, has a single factor explanation of history. Economic Marxism says that all of history is determined by ownership of the means of production. Cultural Marxism of political correctness says that all history is determined by power, which groups defined in terms of race, sex, etc., have power over which other groups. Nothing else matters. And all literature, indeed, is about that. Everything in the past is about that one thing. Third, as just as in classical economic Marxism, certain groups, workers and peasants, are a priori good, and certain groups, the bourgeoisie, capital owners, are evil. So in the cultural Marxism of political correctness, certain groups are good. Feminist women, only feminist women. Non-feminist women are deemed, by the way, not to exist. Blacks, Hispanics, homosexuals, various other groups are determined to be victims and therefore automatically good, regardless of what any of them do. And similarly, similarly, white males are determined automatically to be evil. They are the equivalent of the bourgeoisie in economic Marxism. Both economic and cultural Marxism rely on expropriation. When the classical Marxists, the communists, took over a country like Russia, they expropriated the bourgeoisie. They took away their property. Similarly, when the cultural Marxists take over a university campus or something else, including a society as a whole, they expropriate through things like quotas for admissions. When a white student with superior qualifications is denied admittance to a college, uh, in favor of a black or Hispanic who doesn't have, who is not as well qualified, the white student is expropriated. And indeed, affirmative action in our whole society today is a system of expropriation. White companies, white-owned companies don't get a contract because the contract is reserved for a company owned by, say, Hispanics or women. So expropriation is a principal tool of both forms of Marxism. And finally, both have a method of analysis that automatically gives the answer they want. For the classical Marxist, it's Marxist economics. For the cultural Marxist, it is deconstruction. Deconstruction essentially takes any text, removes all the meaning from it, and then reinserts whatever meaning they desire. So that we find, for example, that all of Shakespeare is about the suppression of women, or the Bible is really about uh, race and gender. Uh, all, of these, all of these texts simply become grist for the mill that prove, quote unquote, that all of history, again, is about which groups have power over which other groups. So the parallels are very evident between the classical Marxism that we're familiar with in the old Soviet Union and the cultural Marxism that we see today as political correctness. But the parallels are not accidental. The parallels did not come from nothing. The fact of the matter is that political correctness has a history, a much longer history than anyone that very many people are aware of outside a small group of academics who have studied this. And the history goes back, as I said, to World War I, as do so many of the pathologies that are today bringing our society and indeed our culture down. Marxist theory said that when the general European war came, as it did come in Europe in 1914, that the working class throughout Europe would rise up and overthrow their governments, the bourgeois governments, because the workers had more in common with each other across national boundaries than they had in common with the bourgeoisie and the ruling class in their own country. 
Well, 1914 came, and it didn't happen. Throughout Europe, the workers rallied to their flag and happily marched off to fight each other. The Kaiser shook hands with the leader of the then Marxist Social Democratic Party in Germany and said, there are no parties now, there are only Germans. And this happened in every country in Europe. So something was wrong. Marxists knew by definition it couldn't be the theory. In 1917, they finally get a Marxist coup in Russia, and it looks like the theory is working. But then it stalls again. It doesn't spread. And when attempts are made to spread it immediately after the war, with the Spartacist uprising in Berlin, with the Belikun government in Hungary, with the Munich Soviet, the workers don't support them. So the Marxists had a problem, and two Marxist theorists went to work on it, Antonio Gramsci in Italy and Georg Lukács in Hungary. Gramsci said that the workers can never see their true class interest, as defined by Marxism, until they are freed from Western culture and particularly from the Christian religion, that they are blinded by culture and religion to their true class interests. Lukács, who was considered the most brilliant Marxist theorist since Marx himself, said in 1919, who will save us from Western civilization? He also theorized that the great obstacle to the creation of a Marxist paradise was the culture, was Western civilization itself. And he gets a chance to put his ideas into practice, because when the homegrown Bolshevik Belakun government is established in Hungary in 1919, he becomes deputy commissar for culture. And the first thing he did was introduce sex education into the Hungarian schools. That ensured, by the way, that the workers would not support the Belakun government, because the Hungarian people looked at this aghast, workers as well as anyone else. But he already had made the connection that today many of us are still surprised by, that we would consider the latest thing. In 1923, in Germany, a think tank is established that takes on the role of translating Marxism from economic into cultural terms, that creates political correctness as we know it today, and that essentially has created the basis for it by the end of the 1930s. <clears throat> this comes about because the young, very wealthy son of a millionaire German trader, a fellow named Felix Weil, has become a Marxist, and he has lots of money to spend. And he is disturbed by the divisions among the Marxists. So he sponsors something called the First Marxist Work Week, when he brings Lukács and many of the key German thinkers together for a week of working on the differences within Marxism. And then he says, what we need is a think tank. Washington's full of think tanks today. We think of those as very modern. In fact, they go back quite a ways. He endows an institute associated with Frankfurt University, established in 1923, that was originally to be known as the Institute for Marxism. But the people behind it decided at the beginning, in a tendency that now is very clear in political correctness as a whole, that it was not to their advantage to be openly identified as Marxists. The last thing political correctness wants is for people to figure out that it's a form of Marxism. So they instead name it the Institut für Sozialforschung, the Institut for Social Research. Weil is very clear about his goals here. In 1971, he wrote to Martin Jay, the author of a principal book on the Frankfurt School, as the Institute for Social Research it soon becomes known as informally. He said, quote, I wanted the Institute to become known and perhaps famous due to its contributions to Marxism. Well, he was successful. The first director of the Institute, Karl Greenberg, an Austrian economist, concluded his opening address, according to Martin Jay, by clearly stating his personal allegiance to Marxism as a scientific methodology. Marxism would be the ruling principle at the Institute, and that never changed. The initial work of the Institute was rather conventional, but in 1930 it acquired a new director named Max Horkheimer. And Horkheimer's views were very different. He was very much a Marxist renegade. In addition, in, in overall, the people who create and form the Frankfurt School are renegade Marxists. They're still very much Marxist in their thinking, but they're effectively read out of the party. Moscow looks at what they're doing and says, wait a minute, this isn't us. 
we're not going to bless this. Horkheimer's initial heresy is he's very interested in Freud. And the key to making the translation of Marxism from economic into cultural terms is essentially that it was, it combined it with Freudianism. Again, Martin Jay writes, if it can be said that in the early years of its history, the Institute concerned itself primarily with an analysis of bourgeois society's socioeconomic substructure, and I'd point out that Jay is very sympathetic to the Frankfurt School. I'm not reading from a critic here. In the years after 1930, its prime interest lay in its cultural superstructure. Indeed, the traditional Marxist formula regarding the relation between the two was called into question by critical theory. The stuff we've been hearing about this morning, the radical feminism, the women's studies departments we see in universities, the gay study departments, the black studies departments, all of these things are branches of critical theory. What the Frankfurt School essentially does is drawing on both Marx and Freud. In the 1930s, it creates a theory that it calls critical theory. The term is ingenious because you're tempted to ask and say, all right, what is the theory? The theory is to criticize. The theory is that the way to bring down Western culture and the capitalist order is not to lay out an alternative. They explicitly refuse to do that. They say it can't be done, that we can't not imagine what a free society would look like, their definition of free, uh, as long as we're living under repression, the repression of a capitalist e economic order which creates in their theory, the Freudian condition, the conditions Freud describes in individuals of, of repression, that we cannot even imagine this. What the critical theory about is simply criticizing. It, is the mo it calls for the most destructive criticism possible in every possible way designed to bring the current order down. And of course, when we hear about Again, these comments that feminists saying that, well, the whole of society today is just out to get women and so on. That kind of criticism is all a derivative of critical theory. It is all coming in the 1930s, not the 1960s. Other key members who join up around this time include Theodore Adorno, and most importantly, Eric Fromm and Herbert Marcuse. Fromm and Marcuse introduce an element which is now central to political correctness, and that's the sexual element. And particularly Marcuse, who in his own writings calls for a society of polymorphous perversity, that's his definition of the future they want to create. Marcuse in particular by the 30s is writing some very extreme stuff on the need for sexual liberation. But this runs through the whole institute. So do most of the themes that we now see in political correctness. Again, as early as the 30s. In Eric's Fromm view, masculinity and femininity were not reflections of essential sexual differences as the romantics had thought. They were derived instead from differences in life functions which were in part socially determined. Sex is a construct. Sexual differences are a construct. The emphasis we now see on environmentalism. Materialism, as far back as Hobbes, had led to a manipulative, dominating attitude towards nature. That was Horkheimer, writing in 1933 in Materialismus und Moral. The theme of man's domination of nature, according to Jay, was to become a central concern of the Frankfurt School in subsequent years. Horkheimer's antagonism, again in the 30s, to the fetishization of labor, here's where they're obviously departing from Marxist orthodoxy, expressed another dimension of his materialism, the demand for human sensual happiness. In one of his most trenchant essays, Egoism and the Movement for Emancipation, written in 1936, he discussed the hostility to personal gratification inherent in bourgeois culture. And he specifically referred to the Marquis de Sade favorably for his protest against asceticism in the name of a higher morality. How does all of this stuff come here? How does it flood into our universities? And indeed, into our lives today? 
The members of the Frankfurt School are Marxist. They are also, to a man, Jewish. In 1933, the Nazis come to power in Germany, and not surprisingly, they immediately shut down the Institute for Social Research. And its members flee. They flee to New York City, and the Institute is reestablished there in 1933 with help from Columbia University. And the members of the school gradually through the 30s, though most of them continue to write in German, they gradually shift their focus from critical theory about German society, destructive criticism of every aspect of that society, to critical theory directed at American society. There is another very important translation when, in, when the war comes, some of them go to work for the government, including Herbert Marcuse, who becomes a key figure in the OSS, the predecessor to the CIA, and some, including Horkheimer and Adorno, move to Hollywood. These origins of political correctness would probably not mean much to us today, except for two subsequent events. The first was the student rebellion here in the mid-1960s, which was driven largely by resistance to the draft and to the Vietnam War. But the student rebels needed theory of some sort. They couldn't just get out there and say, hell no, we don't want to go. They had to have some theoretical explanation behind it. Very few of them were interested in wading through Das Kapital. Classical economic Marxism is not light. And most of the radicals of the 60s were not deep. <laughs> Fortunately for them, and unfortunately for our country today, and not just in the universities, Herbert Marcuse remained in America when the Frankfurt School, after the war, relocates back to Frankfurt. And whereas Mr. Zadorno and Horkheimer in Germany are appalled by the student rebellion when it breaks out there, when the student rebels come into Adorno's classroom, he calls the police and has them arrested. Herbert Marcuse, who remained here, saw the 60s student rebellion as the great chance. The opportunity to take the work of the Frankfurt School and make it the theory of a new left in the United States. And one of his books was the key book in this. It became virtually the Bible of the SDS and the student rebels of the 60s. And that book was Eros and Civilization. The essence of it is that Marcuse argues that under a capitalist order, he downplays the Marxism very, very strongly here. It is, the book is subtitled a Philosophical Inquiry into Freud. But the framework is Marxist. He essentially argues that in a capitalist order, uh, again, repression is the essence of that order, and that gives us the person Freud describes, the person with all the hang-ups, the neuroses, because his sexual instincts are repressed. That we can envision a future, if we can only destroy this existing oppressive order, in which we liberate eros, in which we liberate the libido, in which we have a world, again, his own phrase, of polymorphous perversity, in which you can do your own thing. And by the way, in that world, there will no longer be any work. There will only be play. What a wonderful message for the radicals of the mid-60s. They're students. They're baby boomers. They've grown up never having to worry about anything except eventually having to get a job. And here comes along a guy who's writing in ways they can easily follow, and doesn't require them to read a lot of heavy Marxism and tells them everything they want to hear, which is essentially do your own thing. If it feels good, do it. You never have to go to work. And by the way, Marcuse is the man who creates the phrase make love, not war. He also explicitly states, coming back to the situation people now face on campus, that he defines liberating tolerance as intolerance from any movement coming from the right and tolerance for any movement coming from the left. Marcuse, as I said, joins the Frankfurt School when? In 1932, if I remember right. So all of this goes back to the 1930s. In conclusion, America today is in the throes of the greatest and direst transformation in its history. We are becoming an ideological state a state with an official state ideology enforced by the power of the state. In hate crimes, we now have people serving jail sentences 
for political thoughts. And the Congress is now moving to expand that category ever further. Affirmative action is part of it. The terror against anyone who dissents from political correctness on campus is part of it. It's exactly what we've seen happen in Russia, in Germany, in Italy, in China, and it's now coming here. And we don't recognize it because we just call it political correctness and laugh it off. My message this morning is it's not funny. It's here. It is growing pace. And it is eventually going to destroy, as it seeks to destroy, everything that we have ever defined as our freedom and our culture. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much to all our panelists. They were excellent. We have uh, 10 or 15 minutes for questions, so um, if you would raise your hand, I'd love to uh, have you ask our panelists anything you'd like. Since we have a lot of victim groups here today, I'm sure that a lot of you will. <laughs> uh, yes, Wes. Obviously, Bill, this whole thing that you've discussed uh, predates, if it predates the 60s, it certainly predates Bill Clinton's administration. But when you stop to think about it, does this not dovetail this whole cultural Marxism and political correctness and controlling of thought and controlling of speech dovetail into such things as the FBI files, the IRS audits, uh, truth is whatever you want it to be, harassing uh, ordinary citizens who heckle the president, and that sort of thing. And isn't this combination such that it might be perfect, a right, right for the timing of forming some kind of grassroots movement against this kind of blatant oppression? Well, let me say, first of all, the Clinton administration, Clinton is the first baby boomer president. So it's not surprising that this administration would be steeped in PC. But I would note that this has now spread so far through the establishment. Virtually, it's now a rule. If you're going to be a member of the establishment, you must be politically correct. The last Republican convention that nominated Bob Dole was choreographed for political correctness. And those who didn't share that view were explicitly invited to leave, which they did in the voting booth as well. There's no question that, that the grassroots is sick of this stuff. Americans don't want to have to be afraid of what they think, of what they say, of what they write, of, of saying the wrong thing and being in trouble with some kind of legal or quasi-legal authority for doing it. Um, I think the potential is there for a grassroots resistance movement. I think the most important, the most important thing to do is break the Frankfurt School's own silence. Again, it was very, very careful to disguise its origins, initially in Germany, but then much more so when it came here, and to disguise its Marxism. And if the average American realizes that this stuff is Marxism, that it's a heretical school of it, but it is totally Marxist in, in its origins, uh, that uh, then the light bulb will go on, and he'll realize what he's dealing with. One of the major developments that resulted from the Frankfurt School was the insidious but very effective political correctness movement. And it's effective because it shuts down debate on the issues that they disagree with. You just label it politically incorrect. Uh, they label people racist, fanatics, right-wing extremists. You don't have to get to the issues like moral degeneracy, which they promote. Well, you shut people down. You're bigots and you're too straight-laced. Uh, absurd concepts like diversity is our strength and multiculturalism is promoted. Anybody that takes exception to that or to immigration policies, whatever their, the left's agenda is, that becomes the politically correct. And those that disagree, which the vast majority of the American people do on most of these issues, they shut down debate on it within the media and the institutions, particularly in education, by simply labeling it as politically incorrect. How dare you have these thoughts after we've already told you that this is what we're supposed to believe in, and this is how we're supposed to think, 
that uh, the people themselves really don't get an opportunity and that's why some of these young people have been brainwashed because they're never given the opportunity to hear the opposition point of views and so this is one of the probably the most insidious and most effective weapons that the left has developed is this whole concept of what's politically correct and what is politically incorrect. I don't think that you can understand the current situation properly without considering the role that postmodernism plays in this. Because postmodernism, in many ways, especially as it's played out politically, is the new skin that the old Marxism now inhabits. So you could think that there's, there's a postmodern philosophy, which we'll talk about a bit, that really came into its vogue in the 1970s after classic Marxism, especially of the economic type, had been so thoroughly discredited that no one but an absolute reprobate could, 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 uh, could support it publicly anymore. Even the French intellectuals had to admit that communism was a bad deal by the, by the end of the 1960s. And what happened was that there, they played a sleight of hand game in some sense and rebranded themselves under the postmodern guise. And that's where identity politics came from. And so, and then that spread like wildfire from France especially into the US through Yale University, through the English department there, and then everywhere. And, and so, what happened was, you know, there was this idea that the Marxists had put forth that the natural landscape of, economic landscape, is a battle. And it's a battle between the proletariat, the working class, and the bourgeois. And that the, that, that economic systems were doomed to continue to enslave people and to keep them poor and downtrodden unless there was a radical economic transformation that was predicated on something more like equity policy. And then that was put in, into place in many, many places, as, as you no doubt know, throughout the 20th century, with absolute, m absolutely murderous results. It was the most destructive economic and political doctrine, I think, that was, has ever been invented by mankind, and that includes National Socialism. Because the, the absolute magnitude of the havoc wreaked by the communist systems exceeded that wreaked by Hitler. And, and, and that's, I mean, Hitler didn't have quite as long, as long a time to pull his stunts off quite as effectively. But it was a catastrophic system. And one of the things that's quite interesting is that the full breadth of that catastrophe has, is not something that students are well taught in our current educational system, which has always made me very suspicious. For example, the students I teach usually know nothing at all about what happened in the Soviet Union under Stalin between, say, 19, Stalin and Lenin between 1919 and 1959. They have no idea that millions, tens of millions of people were killed and far more tortured and, and brutalized by, by that particular regime, to say nothing of Mao. So look, what happened was that by the end of the 1960s, the evidence that communism was a catastrophic failure was so overwhelming that even the French intellectuals, and we'll return to them later, like the, the, because the French have a very uh, long-lasting and powerful public intellectual tradition, and so intellectuals there are very influential. Even the French intellectuals like Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre, the famous philosopher, had to admit by the end of the 1960s that the, the, the Stalinist, Communist, Maoist experiment and all of its variants, not just those particular dictators, but all of its variants, was an absolute catastrophic failure. And then what happened was, the postmodernists came onto the scene, and they were all Marxists. But they couldn't be Marxists anymore, because you couldn't be a Marxist and claim that you were a human being by the end of the 1960s. And so they started to play a sleight of hand, and instead of pitting the proletariat, the working class, against the bourgeoisie, they started to pit the oppressor, the oppressed against the oppressor, and that opened up the avenue to identifying any number of groups as oppressed and oppressor, and to continue the same narrative under a different name. It was no longer specifically about economics. It was about power. And everything to the postmodernists is about power. And that's actually why they're so dangerous, because if you're engaged in a discussion with someone who believes in nothing but power, all they are motivated to do is to accrue all the power to them. Because what else is there? There's no logic, there's no investigation, there's no negotiation, there's no dialogue, there's no discussion, there's no meeting of minds and consensus. 
There's power. And so since the 1970s, under the guise of postmodernism, we've seen the rapid expansion of identity politics throughout the universities. It's, came, it's come to dominate all of the humanities, which are, which are dead, as far as I can tell, and a huge proportion of the social scientists, sciences. And we've been publicly funding extremely radical postmodern leftist thinkers who are hell-bent on demolishing the fundamental substructure of Western civilization. And that's no, that's no paranoid delusion. That's, that's, that's their self-admitted goal. And I've identified, not only me, obviously, but one of the main players in this entire drama is a French philosopher named Jacques Derrida, who was, who I think most trenchantly formulated the anti-Western philosophy that is being pursued so assiduously by the radical left. And I think its dangers cannot be, I don't think its dangers can be overstated. And I also don't think the degree to which it's already infiltrated our culture can be overstated. I mean, the, the, the people who hold this doctrine, this radical postmodern communitarian doctrine that, that makes racial identity or sexual identity or gender identity or some kind of group identity paramount, they've got control over most low to mid-level bureaucratic structures. And, and, and many governments as well, but, but even in the United States where, you know, a lot of the governmental institutions have swung back to the Republican side, the postmodernist types have infiltrated bureaucratic organizations at the mid to upper level. And that's actually what they're trained to do by their activist professors in university. And if you want proof of that, you can just go onto the websites of, of women's studies groups, for example, because they're some of the top offenders, and just look at what they say. Well, th th but th that's the issue, is that caring for someone or for a group of people is a very complicated thing. And it doesn't always mean be compassionate and feel sorry for them because they're downtrodden. It's not good enough. Like a lot of the structures that we've put in place to, to help people over the long run are rather harsh in their operations in the short term. I mean, so the, the values that are associated with trait conscientiousness, for example, which are reasonably good predictors of more conservative leaning political belief, aren't warm, fuzzy virtues. They're cold, hard, judgmental virtues. They're, they're the demands for performance, for example, that go along in the workplace. But if you, if you want to take care of an infant who's crying, you want warm, instantaneous, impulsive compassion. Because there's a problem and it needs to be solved right now and you have the solution, right? The baby's too hot, the baby's too cold, the baby needs to be fed. You can fix that right now. If you're dealing with, with systemic problems of poverty, for example, or trying to determine how to, how to produce more opportunity for everyone to benefit from everyone's abilities, you have to use a hell of a lot more than compassion to get there. And to, so to think of, of community in the positive sense as being driven by nothing but Empathy, which is really one of the central arguments of the of the postmodern types At least that's what's driving some of their argumentation is it's an absurd proposition and So it's not so much that they confuse the two things is that they fail to differentiate the concepts to begin with it take, it, It's very very difficult to build functional structures that help people thrive individually and socially over long periods of time and merely being empathetic, man, that's just going to get you nowhere. A three-year-old is empathetic. And, I, and I'm not dis dismissing that. Empathy is important. But as a problem-solving mechanism, it, it has very, very limited utility. Well, you know, this brings me back to, we, we, you talked briefly about, you know, national socialism, fascism, and collectivism. The difference being, from my understanding, fascism was made to control the individual, Marxism was more control of means of production, socialism more means of uh, controlling the fruits of production, if, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I, th I think we've seen the destructive uh, nature of collectivism in destroying the individual, right? Well, I think that's, ac that's actually the point in, in, in large part. I mean, Derrida, for example, f coined a term he called phallogocentrism, which he regarded as the central axiomatic position of the, of the West, eh? Let not only the Enlightenment West, but also the, 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 the Christian, or Judeo-Christian for that matter, West prior to the Enlightenment. Derrida went after the tradition 
running through Judeo-Christianity, through modernism and the, and, the, and the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, and criticized that, and that was the idea that and he, he was critical of this, it, it's the presupposition that culture is first male dominated, which is a presupposition that I take great exception to, because it's a radical oversimplification of the historical story um, to the degree that, that culture was male dominated, it was only dominated by a very small number of males, most males were serfs or soldiers or, or cannon fodder for that matter, or coal miners dreadfully toiling away for their work certainly as oppressed as, as women were in general by the absolute poverty of the conditions. You know, up till 1895, the average person in the Western world lived on a dollar a day in today's money. Right, so I mean, you don't have to go very back, back very far in time be before you find everyone oppressed, but not by the sociocultural s system, merely by the, by the absolute, what, insane difficulty of life itself. Well, so, Derrida described the West as male-dominated, which I think is, a, is, a, is something to take serious issue with as, as a blatant claim it's not differentiated enough or sophisticated enough and he also said it was logos-centric and that partly means logic, but there's a deeper meaning to logos because logos is also the second person of the Christian trinity and Derrida knew that perfectly well and so his criticism Derrida was a smart man, make no mistake about it, and lots of the things he said were correct like, one of the propositions he laid forth was that there is a near infinite number of ways of interpreting any situation or any text which happens to be technically true and, and that's been discovered in all sorts of fields including artificial intelligence so the central claim that he begins with is actually true and, and it's not surprising that it, it had such a powerful effect on the humanities because it's actually an extraordinarily powerful and and uh, undermining idea, but he, uh, but but he took it much far. He took that idea in directions that I don't think it should have gone in at all. But the the logocentric idea is that his criticism of the idea of the logocentric society is a deep criticism of the idea that the individual, as a speaking force, as a communicative force, is the appropriate highest value upon which a culture should be built. He took that apart and criticized it, and, and so that's a, that's a deeper criticism, I would say, even than Marx's criticism, which was mostly about unequal power relationships. Derrida went deeper than that, and the, the postmodernists that occupy the universities are anti-individual right, right down to the bedrock, and so that's partly why they push collectivism to such a degree. They don't give a damn who you are, they care what your group identity is, and that's that. Okay, so here's the claim. And then there's actually people who do this professionally, by the way. They analyze businesses and other organizations by these strategies. And these are often these people, they call themselves diversity consultants, for example. Okay, so here's the claim. Imagine that you take a, a, hi a hierarchy of some sort, like a law firm, a big law firm. Then what you do is you analyze the, the hierarchical structure of the law firm. Then you break down the representation of the people in the law firm by their identity categories. So, how many men, how many women, how many transsexuals? But then you don't stop there, eh? And this is actually part of the technical problem with the approach. You divide them by race. You divide them by ethnicity. You divide them by sexual identity. Okay, so imagine there we've got six categories already, six or seven categories. Now, of course, obviously race is further divisible, as is ethnicity as are such things as attractiveness, right? So there's, there's all sorts of ways of dividing people into groups axiomatically, and there's no self-evident way of determining which of those group divisions should be superordinate and that's partly how the leftists, the radical leftists, can keep gerrymandering the game because they can just keep playing games with the group categor categories in any case you take the organization, you take the bottom hierarchy and you say, the bottom rung, and you say, okay, well, is it 50% men and 50% women? And if the answer to that is no, then you make the claim that the reason for that is because of systemic oppression and prejudice. Oppression, prejudice, bigotry, and usually uh, misogyny. Then you make the case that the people who are organizing the organization are bigoted and misogynist, 
even if it's not consciously, unconsciously, so that's the unconscious bias aspect then you put forward a plan that can include quotas, and increasingly will be to ensure that that hierarchical level is now equal in proportional representation to the population itself now of course conveniently you also get to determine which population you're going to compare it to because that's one of the ways that you get to keep the power when you're doing this you get to decide which groups people are going to be identified with even though there's a near infinite way number of ways people could be divided into groups and you get to decide which population you're going to compare it to so you can keep everybody unstable and off off kilter permanently with that sort of approach well then you so then you you go into the organization and you you uh, make anti unconscious bias training for which there is zero scientific for for the utility of which for, there is zero evidence for the utility of that intervention from a scientific perspective in fact some of the scientific e evidence suggests that if you make unconscious bias training mandatory you make prejudice worse and maybe that's because people don't like to be called bigots and misogynists and to be put through retraining in a mandatory way okay so then you do that you do that in analysis at each rung of the organization now you might say well, why do you do that well the putative reason is equity now equity and equality of opportunity are not the same thing if you hear someone utter the word equity either they don't know what they're talking about and they're ignorant beyond their they're ignorant in a manner that makes it inappropriate for them to engage in a conversation about it or they are the enemy of any they are the enemy of anyone who holds the tenets of individuality dear because equity means equality of outcome and so the real postmodern radicals are using community to mean equity and equity to mean equality of outcome and so then they get to divide up the groups into whatever groups they feel are the groups that should be people should be divided into now and then they get to go make their claims of oppression and misogyny and bigotry and all of that and one of the huge advantages that accrues to them in doing that and since it's all about power is power and that's the game that's being played out and that's happening unbelievably quickly it's the equity issue is something that's it's absolutely unbelievable to me how rapidly people have started to talk about equity and to actually think that that's a, a reasonable goal now the alternative is to let people sort themselves out more or less in a free market manner allowing for the possibility that there are genuine differences between people in intelligence temperament and interest and for which and the notion that those things differ and that a tremendous amount of that difference is a consequence of biological underlying and underlying biological reality is overwhelming and the, the humanities types, the postmodernized types, they know they've lost the scientific battle over this the whole idea that people are a blank slate and that everyone's equal at birth and that everything that makes people differ is a consequence of socialization that bloody idea has been dead among anybody who's reasonably educated as a scientist that's been dead since I would say mid 60s dead it's not no one even talks about it but among these postmodernist types man they don't give a damn for facts they, in fact facts for them are merely whatever the current power hierarchy uses to justify their acquisition of power the people who are animated by the postmodern ethos are not generally in and of themselves thoroughly possessed postmodern philosophers first of all they don't know enough about postmodernism or its underlying Marxism to, to make that claim imagine that the philosophy has a, an impetus it has, a, a, it has a, a core tendency to move in a given direction as a, as a body of ideas a coherent body of ideas and then imagine that it's represented in fragments among people who find its tenets palatable so most student radicals for example are not 100% committed postmodernists they're probably only like 10% committed postmodernists when they're not being foolish with their mob they're out being normal people but you get a mob together that's animated by that postmodern ethos then the collective spirit that animates the mob has that 
power-seeking proclivity and that antipathy towards Western ideals that we've been discussing. I think it's what makes that different, let's say, from, from what was happening in the Soviet Union at the beginning of the Russian Revolution is that there was a organized group of conspirators, Lenin at the head, whose goal was to overthrow the monarchy and to seize power. And that isn't what's happening here. There isn't an organized group of people who are getting together and saying, well, you're going to lead the assault on Western civilization and we're going to produce a new government out of the ruins. It's, it's nothing that explicit and articulated. But the end result is much the same. And, and it's happening, well, I think it's already demolished the universities. So, I think, I think actually irreparably. I think whatever the universities are going to be in 15 years, especially on the humanities end, will bear almost no resemblance to what the universities are now. Right? The, the purpose of those so-called disciplines is to produce radical postmodern activists who will reshape the political and economic structure. In fact, that's part of the coursework. It's like, that's what they do. The, the, the discipline isn't based on the acquisition of, of abstract knowledge. They're activist disciplines. And, you know, I, I use women's studies as, as the core example because I think it's most obvious with women's studies, although all the ethnic gender studies pseudo-disciplines that have emerged in the universities over the last 30 years are all bastard children of exactly the same enterprise but even more appallingly that ethos has moved out into disciplines that at one point had some genuine value anthropology, that's a good one, sociology, social work, education education is done, the faculties of education are so corrupt that it's almost unimaginable they might even be worse than, as a, as, a, as a societal segment, they might even be worse than the women's studies groups because they're, they've seized the educational systems. I mean, I've just been reviewing the Ontario Teachers Federation, ETFO, I think it is, EFTO, Education Federation, I'm sorry, I can't remember the acronym, it doesn't matter. It's a document that's produced by the main teachers organization in Ontario. And I've just been starting to review their curriculum for children from kindergarten to grade 8. It's pure social justice postmodernism. Jesus, they even teach kids to, here's how you interpret a book if you're a postmodernist, like a fiction book. You don't read the book and try to understand what utility might be extracted out of it to guide you in your life. That's the old system. The new system is you read the book and you analyze it in terms of whose societal position of power it justifies. So you look for who the supremacist is in the text. Could be, could be the author, it could be the characters, it doesn't matter. You read the text as if all it does is reflect on the current corrupt power structure that obtains in current society. And that's, that's, that's the beginnings of literary criticism under the social justice regime. And none of this is subtle. These people have gone way beyond subtle. You know, we have social justice tribunals in Ontario. They're named that. And the, the, the educators in Ontario, the teachers, have already decided that the goal of the education system is to indoctrinate children from kindergarten, from kindergarten, into a radical postmodern leftist, communitarian, equity-oriented ethos. That's what they're doing. They're even subsuming the teaching of mathematics and science under that umbrella. And none of this is subtle, man. You just go online and download the documents and read them. And if you read them critically and carefully, well, you do. since I've been really looking into this, which would be since last September, really, starting to look at it from a legislative and policy level. I mean, the first thing I came across was the Ontario Human Commission, Ontario Human Rights Commission website, which is an absolute travesty. Those people are so dangerous, it's almost, you, you almost can't believe it. That thing, that, the Ontario Human Rights Commission, it should be abolished. It's a very subversive and dangerous organization, as are the human rights tribunals. Those things are dangerous. 
The Ontario Institute for the Studies of Education? That bloody thing is a fifth column. The people who, the people who are who are producing the educators that emerge from that institute, they should be put on trial for treason. Like, it's serious stuff. And the idea that the purpose of education is to, it's to get them while they're young, you know, in kindergarten, so that this radical, postmodern, Marxist ideology can be so thoroughly inculcated among people when they're young that they have no chance of escaping from it. And that's what's happening in the education systems. It's unbelievable. You know, every day I come across new policy statements of this sort that, that make my jaw drop. It's like, as Canadians, we're so accustomed to our political system working that we don't pay any attention to it. And so when you, when you ring the bell and say, hey, there's a problem, people think, no, there's not. This is Canada, for Christ's sake. There's no problems here. You must be insane. Right? And that's the right thing for them to think. Of course, when I started talking about Bill C-16 back in October, the first wave of public response was something like, this professor is uh, like a demagogue who's, what, exaggerating the danger because of his own problems and for whatever, uh, what, reputation might accrue to him. And the funny thing about that criticism is that was the right criticism, right? Because when someone stands up in a country that functions and says, hey guys, there's something really rotten going on here, the first thing you should do is assume that that person has gone off the rails. But the problem is that I haven't gone off the rails. That's the problem. The problem is that the problems that I'm pointing to, they're real. Like, look, I, I talked over the last two weeks, three weeks, to, pro, to, I would say, you know, if you imagine Canada's top 20 journalists, mostly in print, I talked to 10 of them. They're all terrified of speaking out about such things, say, as cultural appropriation. These are the main journalists in Canada. They're already censoring themselves with regards to what they'll print, and if they don't censor themselves, their editors will. And these aren't, like, these aren't low-level people. These are people who have massive reputations, and you'd think that, that would be sufficient, you'd think, to protect them from being mobbed. But they're, they're terrified. Well, the tolerance issue is interesting, because what tolerance means is... I'm stupid and flawed, and so are you, so I'll make you deal. You don't harass me too much about my stupidity and flaws, and I'll try to leave you the hell alone too. And that's a pretty good deal for everybody. So that's, that's the tolerance issue, right? It's we're all flawed, and if we demand too much of one another, in terms of perfection and uni unity of belief, or even unity of thought, or even coherence of thought, then we're going to end up permanently at each other's throats, so we should just try not to make unnecessary enemies, that's tolerance, and it's, it's, a good, it's a good principle. The diversity issue, the toler tolerance doesn't mean anything goes, that's not tolerance, that's refusal to take responsibility for mature discrimination, and discrimination has also become a a dirty word. It's like, there's no difference between discrimination and thinking. They're the same thing. Now, you might say, well, what about unfair discrimination? It's like, well, that's a whole different issue. It's like, if you have person A and person B, and they're both equally qualified for a job, there's something wrong if you let something other than their qualifications determine whether or not they should get the job. I mean, there's no, no one debates that seriously anymore. You know, so if somebody doesn't get a job because of their race, everybody says, well, you know, what the hell's wrong with you? You're, you're not taking advantage of the person's talent. You're, you're doing society a disservice, and you're hurting individuals unnecessarily. You shouldn't do that. It's like, okay, fine. We all agreed about that back in, like, 1965. That's covered. So, but, but the idea that anything goes with regards to tolerance and lack of discrimination, that's an entirely different thing. That does not mean that all people are the same, or that all abilities are the same, or that everything is of equal value. And so, there's, there's a big difference between tolerance and nihilism. And so, lots of people say tolerance when they mean, well, anything goes, I can do whatever I want, I don't have to be responsible for anything, I don't have to think, and there's no difference between people no matter how they act. It's like, sorry, that's not a philosophy, man. That's a recipe for chaos and disaster. And then the diversity thing, it's like, 
oh, I see, we need more black people on our board because all black people think the same way. That's how we're going to play this, is it? We're not going to be able to think. So, so it's such a pernicious philosophy because it, it's predicated on the idea that the way someone thinks is inextricably tied with their group identity. Well, that's what the bloody racists used to think. You know, well, no, we're not going to invite, uh, let's say, Iranians into our culture because all those Iranians think the same way. Well, I thought that was what racism was. And so the idea that unless you have your bloody board of governors, say, or, or, your, or the middle strata of your organization arranged so that every single group has equitable representation, you don't get a diverse range of opinions. It's so, first of all, that's just technically wrong because it isn't racial and ethnic and gender diversity that gives you diverse opinions. That's just an idiotic, that's just a... I don't know how you could be... I can't understand how you could be so... uninformed, historically and technically, that that argument would make sense to you. But apart from that, it's clearly... See, the bloody postmodernists, they're, they're always criticizing what they call bio, biological essentialism. So if I say, well, look, you know, on average, women have a different set of interests on, than men, which they do, by the way, and that's not sociocultural. They say, well, that's biological essentialism. That's wrong. But then when it comes to race, they're perfectly willing to say, oh, well, you have to have an equitable representation of all the different races because otherwise you won't get the proper diversity of opinions. It's like, well, hold on a sec. Is race a biological construct? And does... And you don't get the bloody diverse opinions without them emerging from this underlying biological construct? How is that not biological essentialism? And it's biological essentialism of the worst type. It's... And having said all that, I would also caution people against making the assumption that what the radical postmodernists say they're after has anything to do with what they're actually after. Because they're not after equity. They're not after tolerance. They're not anybody's friend. Not at all. They're power. They're after power. And that's it. And they use all this compassion language, which is like, you scratch, you just have to scratch the surface of that and you find out how fast that vanishes. They use all this compassion language and I'm on the side of the oppressed. All of that posturing. It does nothing but mask the underlying drive to power. And, it, and that's in keeping with their own damn philosophy, because the, for the postmodernists, there is nothing but power. But the, there's an idea that emerged in the West, and the idea is that the state is regulated by the ethic of the individual. And so that the individual has intrinsic value, and that value is predicated on the recognition of the individual's capacity to generate order out of chaos. And that's the identity with God that was, was implanted, so to speak, in human beings at the beginning of time, according to our founding, let's call them, mythologies. There's something about that that's, that's right. Now, if we lose that, we're going to suffer for it, man. We're going to suffer for it. And I, like, I've studied totalitarianism for a long time. I know what happens when things take a viciously communitarian twist. It is not pretty. And, you know, people think our society is more, even the radical leftists who criticize it, think that our society is more robust and Im impervious to subversion and danger than it actually is. It's actually not... It's actually... We could lose it a hell of a lot more easily than we think. And it's got all sorts of flaws, and like, criticize away, but with a bit of gratitude, that would be nice. It's got all sorts of flaws, but we don't have anything better to put in its place. And when we've tried, we tried a couple of different variations in the 20th century. Man, and that did not go very well. Now, if people want to bring that back, it's either because they don't know what happened, and they probably don't, because generally speaking, people are, people's historical education is so dreadfully inadequate that it's actually, it's, it's, it's like a crime. Or, they don't care, and what they're aiming for is trouble. And neither of those things are good. So, you know, I've been watching this politically correct thing develop for three decades. You know, it's, it's popped its head up here and there. It happened really in the 1990s, in the early 1990s, but then it sort of faded away to some degree. But right now, man, it's back with a vengeance.
You know, in Bill C-16 in Canada, that's going to pass. And that is the first piece of legislation ever put in place in Canada that compels speech. And the justice minister curses on her head. The justice minister is refusing to, and, and her coterie of minions, are refusing to implement a am perfectly reasonable amendment that was proposed by, by Senator Don Platt to, in, to reword the Canadian Bill of Rights to ensure that Bill C-16 doesn't interfere with free speech. And they refuse to do it. Why? Because equity trumps everything. Equality trumps everything. It's, and that's, that's, that's not good, to put it simply. That is not good. And so, so people need to wake up and see what's happening. And they need to start watching what their children are being taught. That, that, that the new policies of the, of the Ontario Teachers Federation, as I said, I've got the acronym wrong, those should be scrapped. I would tell people, do not send your children to public schools. If you're going to send them to public schools, you better bloody well keep an eye on what they're being taught. And I would say that's, that's particularly true for communities of relatively conservative immigrants and minorities. You know, I mean, historically, they've been aligned, say, more with the Liberal Party in Canada because of its more tolerant attitude towards immigration. It's like, it's time for those relatively socially conservative ethnic immigration communities to wake up and realize that the people that they thought were their allies are not their allies at all. So, no, we're going too far down this road. It's not a good idea. And it's happening a lot faster than people think. So, it's time for people to wake up. Jesus, you know, I've talked to the conservatives, the leadership, many of the people who ran for the leadership, federally. I've talked to the provincial conservatives in Ontario. The provincial conservatives were too afraid to have me come and talk to their caucus. Think about that. They think I'm too... They, because, you know, their, their theory, this, this is Patrick Brown's strategy, is if, if they just shut the hell up and hide in the corner, Kathleen Wynne will flame out, and they'll win the election. It's like, well, maybe, and maybe not, but that's no strategy of courage. It's like the conservative types, even the liberals, the classic liberals, have to get out there and say, look, what's happening on the radical end of the political spectrum? That is not good. We need to do something about it. But they're too afraid. The, the conservatives are afraid that they will be targeted as individuals, mobbed by the social justice warriors online, and taken out. And so they, they don't say anything. They, not, it's not even the social conservatives who won't say anything. It's like mainstream liberals who won't say anything. Well, as soon as people... So now, the journalists are censoring themselves. They've already told me that. The politicians are censoring themselves. It's like, what the hell? What's going on? And, it's, and, and what's really awful about it is it's a very small minority of people who are basically producing this movement forward. It's probably no more than about 5% of the population. So... And the other thing that's so interesting is if you push back against them hard, they just fold. I can't even get the social justice types to debate me. They won't do it. Now, they don't believe in debate, so why would they debate? They only believe in power. But like when I went to Queen's University to talk to the law students there about Bill C-16, from what I gathered, all of the law professors were invited to debate me. Now, think about it. I'm not a bloody lawyer. I'm no law professor. I'm talking about legislation. Like, a good lawyer should have been able to come out and just have twisted me into knots and sent me home in a cast. And they couldn't find a single bloody professor to come out there. So Bruce Party, who's a professor, had to come out and play devil's advocate. So they're not, there's no debate there. There's no discussion. So this small minority, they're well situated. They have a philosophically driven agenda. They're, they're motivated personally by resentment and power. But there aren't that many of them, and they're bloody cowardly. And if you face them down, they'll run away. So I would say we should face them down before they continue to wreak the kind of havoc that they're already wreaking on our society. And we could certainly start with Kathleen Wynne and her coterie of, of radical postmodernists. So we should chase every single liberal, every single provincial liberal should be taken out of the Ontario legislation in the next election. That would be a good outcome. That would be a message. It's like, don't muck about with the structure of the family. There's a start. So...
yeah, well. But the thing is, people are afraid. So the conservatives won't come out even, the conservatives won't even come out and be conservative. So, uh, one of the things I've talked to them about, and I think I talked to five of the people who were involved in the leadership convention, was if you guys are afraid to be conservative, you've already lost. You're done. Like, you're just playing out an empty game. And they are. That's the policies they're pursuing. Patrick Brown won't come out and, like, what the hell? Kathleen Wynne, she should be hanging on with one finger. If that woman had an ounce of integrity, she would have resigned when her popularity fell below 10%. But she doesn't, and no one will take her on with regards to that. So, it's not good. I can tell you one thing that I've experienced. If you're not happy with the kind of policies that your company is putting in place, or the bureaucracy that you work in, or your government, or any of those things, if you're not happy about it, and you wait, the probability that you'll become more unhappy is extraordinarily high if you come out and say something early on you're taking a risk but if you say something and you don't apologize and you, and you hold your damn position you can chase them back that's been my experience you don't apologize you know, and you don't soften what you have to say but as far as I'm, I can tell, you've got a choice, you can wait around until things get worse and you're weaker and you can wait till you're taken out or you can stand up now and say what you have to say with a reasonable chance of success that's how it looks to me a very small proportion of extremely radical people have managed to grip the the, the steering mechanisms of our of our of our large scale social structures it's like were we asleep? And the answer is, yeah. That, you, you fall asleep when things are too good for too long. So, it's time to wake up, man. It's, and it's time to notice that the liberals that we're electing are not liberals. They're not, even, they're not even socialists. They're way the hell to the left of that. And so, how did that happen? No one expected that. Oh, yeah, that wasn't real communism. Yeah, we've seen a great example of that in Venezuela where they put everybody on the kind of weight loss plan that's made the average citizen lose 20 pounds right? everyone's starving in Venezuela it's like, hey look, another example of what wasn't real communism so, I know what that means, I've thought about that for years what, when someone says that wasn't real communism, here's what it means I am so narcissistic and arrogant and so convinced of the rightness of my ideology and of my moral purity that if I was the dictator of a communist state, the utopia would have come in as promised that's what it means that wasn't real communism that's what that means so whenever, when anyone ever says that, you think, oh boy I've got your number now, I know what you think of yourself you think that had you been Stalin that there wouldn't have been so much blood it's like, you think again besides, if you would have been the positive Stalin, let's say one of the negative Stalins would have come along and killed you real quick so don't be hypothesizing down that road too quickly that's what, they were the useful idiots and, then, you know, and Stalin killed all the old guard all of them it's like, you guys you've done your part, all you are now is annoying and threatening it's like, we'll just line you up and shoot you you know, Solzhenitsyn has done a perfectly fine job of documenting Lenin and Stalin's essential similarity of character, you know, because people say, oh well, the road Lenin was on, that would actually would have been a good one, but it was perverted by Stalin, it's like, oh no, Stalin was Lenin's slightly more evil twin and, and Lenin trained him anyways, because he'd set Stalin out to do all his dirty work, and Stalin learned how to do that real well so there's no saying, oh yeah, well it was a good idea to begin with, and Lenin was on the right track, but then it was a cult of personality, it's like, no, sorry guys, that isn't going to wash